Hello and welcome. My name is Mark Horseman and I am a data evangelist with Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Quality Management, sponsored by Informatica and Reltio. It is the latest installment in a monthly webinar series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A section. If you would like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, you'll find the icons for those features in the bottom middle of your screen. To answer the most commonly asked question, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within a couple of business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link to the recording of this session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me pass to Marcus for a word from our sponsor, Informatica. Hello, Marcus. Hello, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, so yeah, my name is Marcus. I'm a product manager here at Informatica and I am responsible for uh, our data observability functionality. And uh, yeah, wanna show you a little bit of uh, what we can do in regards to data observability and how it can help to improve your data quality management. Uh, so, I mean, data observability is a term that's uh, widely used at the moment, but uh, I wanna still give a uh, uh, starting with small distinction to data quality. So what's the difference between data quality and data observability? And of course, uh, data observability doesn't replace data quality practices. Uh, they are as valid as ever. And um, this is also just a very high level distinction between the two. Of course, if you go into details, there is, uh, there is much more to it. But at a high level, data quality, typically data quality practices, you define your rules, right? You create rules, you apply them to the data, and then you see how the data adheres to those rules. Data observability, on the other end, brings out of the box anomaly detection. In data quality, you need to know what you're looking for, right? You need to know that to actually create the rules. And uh, data observability extends that to identify issues that maybe you were not actively looking for. So one thing that customers tell us a lot is that uh, they typically operate in a way that they have a data outage, they have a data issue, and then they create rules to identify that in the future and prevent that from affecting them in the future. So it's very reactive. Data observability, because it looks at all the data, even uh, data that you haven't created rules for, will help you to bridge that gap. Likewise, uh, data, setting up data quality rules requires experts and expertise. So uh, going back to, you need, you need to know your data. Data observability on the other end is AI driven and automated. And then data quality focus really on, on the data itself. And while well, data observability as well looks at the data, it also looks at different types of metadata, for example, from pipelines. So how long does a pipeline typically run? Was it executed at the time that it should have been executed? Was there a difference in the number of rows that have been moved, so on and so forth? Now, looking at uh, what uh, we do at Informatica here, so looking a little bit more deeper at what types of, anom of anomalies will data observability be able to detect and how does it work? So data observability functionality looks at the data and the history, how specific metrics changed, and it tries to understand patterns and identify anomalies within changes that don't adhere to those patterns. And uh, typical metrics that you would see a lot is volume. So how did the volume change of the specific data set? Completeness, uniqueness, data types or schema changes. So all of those are typical metrics that data observability functionality will be uh, based on and looking after. As we see here in that, uh, that example um, of, uh, of our product is that uh, we had a specific row and we didn't set that up, right? We didn't create a rule here that uh, looked at the number of distinct values in a specific row. Um, but based on the history that it always was 100% distinct, now it dropped suddenly 
this is something that will be reported. And again, you didn't have to create a rule for that. All of that is out of the box. It's automatically applied to the complete data set. And in case it detects any anomalies, those anomalies will be reported. Now, what you can then do as well is say, well, actually, that change is expected for whatever reason. Or you can give feedback that, yes, this was an anomaly. We identified the issues and we fixed it. And by that, the anomaly detection algorithms will be trained to get better over time with your input. Now, the other very crucial part here is if we look at lineage. So lineage is, is very important. And in the context of data observability, that's even more important. So lineage gives you two things. Uh, first of all, you understand the root cause and then also the impact. So if we look at that table in the middle, on the left side, this is the root cause. So this is where the data comes from. And as we can see with those little exclamation marks here, that table has issues as well. So we need to look there. This is where the issues are originated from. And then what we also see is um, on, the, on the right side, this is the impact. So how many other assets will be impacted by those uh, data quality issues uh, if you don't fix them? So this gives you a very holistic view about what's happening in the data, where is it coming from, and what's the impact? That's All right. great, Marcus. And yeah. If you're interested in, check it out. Thank you. Back to Great. Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And now let me pass to Aaron for a word from our sponsor, Reltio. Aaron, take it away. Thank you very much, Mark. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here today and uh, to talk with you about Reltio's point of view when it comes to data quality management. As we all know, all Business initiatives depend on trusted data. Um, and at relative to our point of view is really that that needs to be timely, um, high quality data. So it's being delivered wherever it's needed and also whenever it's needed. And so question is, well, how do you deliver that data in a timely fashion? And um, from our experience, the requirements to do that are having a modern and integrated approach to data unification. Um, that underlies that data quality management. So what do I mean by that? Well, that requires building on a strong cloud foundation, being able to deliver data to anywhere that it's needed within milliseconds. Um, so you're able to support real-time operational use cases, like having your customer-facing teams getting up-to-date customer information right when they're going into meetings or live interactions with the customers. And to do all that, you need to have your data quality tightly integrated with other data management systems like master data management, reference data management, data governance, data integration, and more so that you have a good control of what data flows into your data quality solution. And also you're able to take action on the issues that your data quality solution sees. So let me drill into each of those a little bit more. Um, so I talked about the need for having a strong cloud foundation. And there's um, really a couple of key pieces of that. One is having a cloud native solution, something that works on any of the major cloud platforms and has extensive experience and extensive customers live in the cloud, processing high volumes of data and moving that data in real time within milliseconds. There's many solutions that come from a legacy on-premises world where um, the ability to move data is hampered because you need to add infrastructure in order to scale up. Whereas in the cloud native world, it's as simple as um, scaling up your resources um, with elasticity. And you're also able to do things like getting the um, the resources needed to support that real-time performance through load balancing, et cetera. And like at Reltio, we've been in the um, cloud native space exclusively um, since day one as a company. We have over 10 years of experience offering um, cloud native MDM and data quality. And that extensive experience has also allowed us to 
focus on um, other innovations since we've have that experience in the cloud space we're able to do things like look at innovation in the ml space and really optimizing that real-time performance um, next is having that integrated approach to data quality and how i like to think of this is my favorite children's book is if you give a mouse a cookie and how it goes is if you give a mouse a cookie is going to ask for a glass of milk and that's kind of how data quality is if you start using a data quality solution well then you're going to wonder how do i manage the quality of the data that's flowing into that. And that's where core MDM capabilities like matching and merging that allow you to deduplicate come in to play. And you're also going to want um, to be able to govern the policies that are creating the rules that you see within your data quality solution. So that's where data governance comes in. And of course, you need to be able to integrate across many different systems in a high volume and real time fashion. So that's where data integration comes in, both being able to do that uh, by building your own integrations low code and leveraging many pre-built integrations. And last, um, it also doesn't hurt in the integrated approach to have um, some ways to get started faster. So having some pre-built industry and domain specific data models, business rules, et cetera, to help you get going faster on managing your data quality. Um, so, so to kind of bring it all together on the, the RELTO front, we provide that continuous data quality management in real time out of the box with an interactive dashboard that you can drill into to see things like source systems and any issues with your attributes. And that allows you to um, address these issues on the fly. And we've helped um, global companies, um, like here's just one quick example of a Fortune 500 company that manages a high volume of data in RELTIO. And by doing so was able to have benefits like delivering um, addresses in real time to their logistics teams that allowed them to save hundreds of thousands of dollars in shipping costs. Um, so that's one small example of the, the benefit of that continuous data quality and why it's important to take that modern and integrated approach. And with that, I'll pass it back awesome. over to you, Mark. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Aaron. And now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter Aiken is an acknowledged data management authority, is an associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of Damir International, and associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in over 30 countries. Among his books are the first on CDOs, the first describing the use of monetization for, uh, of data for profit and good, the first on modern strategic data thinking. International recognition has resulted in an intensive schedule of events worldwide. Peter also hosts the longest running data management webinar series. This one right here hosted on, on dataversity.net from 1999 before Google, before data was big and before data science. He founded Data Blueprint, a consulting firm that helped more than 150 organizations leverage data for profit, improvement, competitive advantage, and operational efficiencies. His latest venture is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello, my friend. And how are you, my friend? It's uh, good to talk to everybody. Thanks for uh both uh, Marcus and Aaron for kicking us off with some really good stuff. And uh, actually, Mark, I got a real quick announcement today. Uh, you mentioned a lot of books, and of course, they're always on sale. But uh, this is the grand announcement of the latest book that my uh, writing partner, Todd, and I have produced, uh, focusing in here on ethical issues. And hopefully, we'll get a webinar on that in the next uh, uh, round of these things. We're on our 13th year and finishing up uh, that as we head towards the, uh, the end of the season here. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking with us for 13 years. It's been great. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about data quality management. And to, to take a little bit what our colleagues presented there, they have some very nice tools that will help this stuff. And you really can't do it without the tools. It's very difficult uh, in that sense to, to try and approach it there. But this is going to talk a little bit about what you need and what direction that you need to have in order to direct the tools to be 
focused in on the right kinds of problems that are there. Our agenda for today is pretty straightforward. We're going to approach data quality. We're going to say, what do we need to get better at? And then how do we go through the process of getting it better in there? And of course, if you saw the preview for this, you know that there's a, a little story about Popeye we're going to tell at some point in here as well. I wrote a book back in the 1990s with Clive Finkelstein that really tried to address some of these questions here. And the, the, the question was, why haven't more organizations taken a more proactive approach? And the answer was actually quite complicated. Fixing these problems is not an easy task uh, uh, in that uh, the tools help, but that it's also uh, uh, requires you to understand the context in which this is occurring. It's kind of dangerous. As soon as you start putting your hand up and saying, hey, there's data quality problems here, people will come after you and your efforts are not likely to be understood at first. You could make things worse. And by the way, since you've said data three times, now you're the data expert and you get to fix it. A single data quality problem can grow into a very uh, significant unexpected investment around all of these things. I'm gonna start off with an example that uh, actually morphs halfway through it. Uh, we start out by talking about data warehousing successful. Uh, many people are, are interested in this, but it turns out the same message can be applied to your cloud initiatives. In fact, the number one issue in CIO land these days is how do I reduce my cloud bill? And the reason for that is because most people, whether they're doing a data warehouse or the cloud, do what's called forklifting their data into it. The problems with forklifting are that there's no basis for any decisions being made about the process at all. There's no inclusion of architecture or engineering concepts in there. There's no idea that these concepts are missing from the process. And let's be quite frank and realistic, 80% of organizational data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial. So how, of course, should this be done, whether you're moving it to the cloud or we're moving it into a warehouse, you really should take this as a transformational opportunity and move your data into a different format so that there is less of it, it is cleaner in volume, and it is by definition more shareable than it has been otherwise. This is the point at which you can make sure that you say only data of known quality is going to end up in our cloud or data warehouse or whatever the new system is that you're going to move things to, and it gives you an opportunity to do what we call data branding, which is becoming even more important here. I don't want just any data, I want data that has some known characteristics because fixing data in the clouds is very much like using a glove box. Uh, it can be problematic, and of course, each time you move it in or out, it is charged to you, and people eventually say, hey, don't do that so much, but of course you say, I need to do that in order to clean up the data that should have been cleaned on the way in as opposed to, in fact, many data quality problems are very much like these folks at the bottom of Niagara Falls complaining about the quality of the water. Uh, it really has to be moved way uphill, way upstream in order to do this. And that's because, as most of our colleagues said earlier, data quality problems are not trivial. There are a lot of dimensions to it. We can look at architecture quality dimensions, model quality dimensions, value quality dimensions, representation quality dimensions. And for those of you that are the data modelers in the group here, you can see that this involves one to many relationships all the way up and down. These are challenging. So there's a lot more representational issues, which on this end of the scale, the left-hand side of your screen as you're looking at it, tend to be what are called practice related data quality challenges. There are many more of them and they are closer to the user. But in often times, we end up finding data structure related quality problems where they are fewer, they are remote to the uses and to management as well, but nevertheless insidious in terms of what we're attempting to fix. And I'm gonna use those two terms here on this next slide to show you that data quality dimensions involve all four of these aspects and failure to consider many of them can leave you with some very significant problems around this. What we're trying to do, of course, with data is to make it fit for purpose, but you can't do that by looking at one or the other of these. Most people only look at practice-related challenges in there. These are challenges that fail in rigor when you're capturing or manipulating the data and have things such as presenting the data out of sequence or tagging it incorrectly, whereas the structure-related problems means that the data itself was arranged imperfectly. Uh, on this. I'll give you a couple of examples as we go on here. Uh, first of all, is a 
uh, a practice oriented challenge uh, in this. If we look at something here, we're seeing that if you've been in for surgery recently, uh, the surgeon will oftentimes make you write on your knee which knee you are going to operate upon. This is a good example of a practice related piece, something that can be fixed easily and uh, happens because unfortunately uh, it's not a, a total quality management type activity and there are a lot more uh, uh, knees that are operated on the wrong one when the patient is already unconscious than not. And again, I'm not picking on uh, orthopedic surgeons or anything like that. It's just a thing that happens and, and we'd like it to be lessened as much as we can. Turning now to a structure oriented problem though, the city of New York has always had problems with trees and there are about 200, uh, excuse me, 25 million trees in the city. And if we take just one 11 month period that was covered by the article that I'm referencing here below, they had a number of people killed by just trees or limbs falling in Central Park. And the arborists in the city believe that pruning these trees can keep them healthier. Uh, the problem was until recently, there was no data to back it up. And the challenge was that within there, we were trying to say, does pruning of trees in once a year reduce the number of hazardous tree conditions in the following year? The problem was a, a challenge of granularity. The pruning data was recorded block by block in New York City, whereas the cleanup data was recorded at the address level. And of course, trees don't come with primary keys, so consequently, it was difficult for them to crosswalk between the two types of data sets and come up with an answer, which is that pruning trees for certain types of hazard caused a 22% reduction in the number of times the department had to send in crews for emergency cleanup. Now, the best type of analysis in this case always generates further questions, and New York can't prune every block every year, but they now have the ability to do risk profiles on each block. Again, just one example, if the data had been structured well in the first place, they would have been able to answer it, but who could have anticipated a question such as this? On the other hand, those of you that are involved in CRM initiatives have faced this one as well, which is the idea that we have multiple customers in there who are really the same person with the same identity or the same party, if you want to get to that level of things. Here's one where it came off of a website and was auto-completed. J.E. Smith is the name. Here's another one, the call center heard that the call center person had you know, a bad connection, so they wrote the person's name down as Joni Smith rather than Joni Smith. The third party mailing list might have come up with it as Joni Smith, and uh, a customer database was purchased from somewhere got right at Joni Smith. Nobody, of course, realizes that she's all the same person, and this kind of problem is really at the heart of most going digital initiatives because so many of these going digital initiatives attempt to do so by just giving lip service to data, not realizing that this is a meme, a project by some random person in Nebraska has been thanklessly maintaining since 2003 can cause the entire thing to fail. Yes, the data pieces are critically important. And unfortunately, our level of knowledge of this is such that I saw this recently on LinkedIn. Uh, somebody posted out there and said, I've had a recent technology innovation which is to say that if I put something bad into anything awesome, I'm going to end up with some problems. And that this statement is true with blockchain and without blockchain, which of course we go, wow, that's a not terribly insightful insight. But once again, this is somebody with a recent analogy. This should be basic 101 that is taught in all college and university, much less high school pieces, because garbage in, garbage out. No matter what I've got in the center, whether it's blockchain, AI, MDM, or anything else, by the way, especially AI, but we'll come back to that in a little bit, uh, it's always going to be true that you need to have quality data in order to get these things to work. And that in order to do quality data, it helps to normalize your data flows for starters, which most organizations don't. Remember, my total there is one and a half billion dollars saved organizations over a lifetime of doing this. And now, only when we have good quality data going in can we, in fact, get good quality outputs of this. The most important aspect of this are your data scientists who are chomping at the bit to do some machine learning. But these machine learning efforts are running into problems because they are all developed on what are called learning algorithms, which are unable, in fact, to deal with it because they don't have the right types of training data in order to do this. So I've been talking for a few minutes here. Let's talk about some definitions. Quality data, thanks to Martin Epler, is data that is fit for purpose and it's synonymous with information quality. 
the management of this involve life cycle activities and things that we'd like to have running all the way around uh, on this to give us a full cycle on this. And data quality engineering is the idea that we need to do it from an engineering perspective and make sure that we get things to work. Now, I put, of course, the Popeye logo up here because this is a very famous example of a data quality problem. Many of you will remember from the Popeye cartoons that he eats his can of spinach and therefore gains some additional abilities. Turns out that's a data quality error where the original measured uh, piece of uh, data quality was 3.5 milligrams of iron per 100 grams of spinach, but was recorded at 35 milligrams and not till 50 years later was it actually corrected. So we have lots and lots of these challenges that are, are with us that have caused problems throughout and are relatively unknown as far as that goes. The problem I analogize it to the princess on the P from Christian Anderson. Here's the P down here at the bottom uh, being a data quality problem causing sleeplessness in this case for the princess forever. Now, that means that with doing a bad job of data quality, you lock in imperfections for the life of the application, restrict future data investment benefits, and decrease organizational data leverage, accounting for 20 to 40% of all IT budgets being devoted to migration, conversion, and improvements in this area. Doing these poor job with data quality causes everything to take longer, cause more, and encumber a whole huge series of data debt. This data debt means that you have to develop new skills in your organization in order to address these kinds of problems the organization facing. This kind of problems lead to things that are not recognized, although most of us would understand hoarding here. Uh, again, slowing things down, decreasing our overall quality, increasing the amount of cost, and presenting greater amounts of risk. One of the main reasons this occurs is because organizations are still learning to separate the wheat from the chaff in terms of their data. Many organizations ask the question, is it worthwhile to invest in well-organized data? The answer is, of course, yes, thanks to Abby Cobert here. By the way, I recommend her book, which I'll pop up here in a second, uh, very highly. It's a, a wonderful book, How to Make Sense of Any Mess. It's information architecture for those that are not information architects. But she asked the question, imagine if instead of getting the book presented to you in a nice order with alphabetic tables of contents and indices, instead we took the spine off the book and randomly distributed the pages about. The knowledge becomes ephemeral very, very quickly, showing clearly the value of increased organization in your data. That said, 80% of your organization's data is redundant, obsolete, or trivial and something that you should not put your quality efforts into. Because of course, what we're trying to attend, this is first of all, finding the people who are best qualified to accomplish these initiatives and then leveraging their efforts appropriately. So you can understand once again, as an engineering concept, hence my focus on data quality engineering, if I have the right leverage components, I can take a 10 kilogram weight and make it balance a hundred kilogram weight uh, in order to do that. And if I add more weight to the right-hand side, I can actually lift that particular piece. Well, data quality similarly is organizational data on the left dealt with from a technology perspective. Both of our sponsors today gave us really good examples of some super technology that can be utilized in this process. We also, of course, need to involve people into it. Our knowledge workers understood this is hopefully what you're getting from this particular webinar on this. And then you need to approach it with a process that hopefully is guided by strategy. This is a three-legged stool that is unavoidable in this type of a context. And if we reduce the size of the data, it reduces the rot and increases the data leverage on the other side of it. So data leverage permits organizations to manage their better both within the organization and with their data exchange partners in support of the organizational mission and the leverage is obtained by the people process and technology set focused on the non-ROT data. The bigger the organization, the greater the leverage potential increases. And by treating your data more asset-like, it lowers, simultaneously lowers IT costs and increases knowledge worker productivity. Let me give you a very specific example. Of this from my friend, Chris Bradley. If I look at the little bouncy dot up there in the right-hand corner, you'll see that that is a what I represent as reference metadata. Reference metadata may keep track of something like what countries do we business, 
uh, in what types of accounts are available, what controlled vocabulary items are we doing it? And we get asked the question, can we do business overseas? Not if we don't set it up at the reference level. Uh, in order to do that, that reference data then controls the accessible values for master data. We're also calling it main or golden or primary data, in this case, to be politically correct. Uh, on this, I've had an organization suggest all sorts of things. None of them have really caught on just yet. But this controls access to the system capabilities. For example, I can't determine the product origin if I didn't record it in the first place, or I can't add a foreign language to the website if the website wasn't designed to handle multiple languages first place. Of course, that reference data controls the master data. The master data controls the transactional data, which is things like I spent $5 to buy an apple today, uh, or that my transaction is authorized, or that I might make a like on a social media site. In this case, again, Chris gave us a wonderful example of this here. It is a really good example of the kind of leverage that happens in here. Now I'm going to run you through a series of events that are not always recognized as data quality challenges. Uh, the first one here is the IRS sending stimulus checks to dead people. This is the kind of thing that makes me as a data professional just blow steam out of my head uh, on this. The Washington Post said, oh my God, we sent, uh, sent payments to 1 million payments to uh, dead people, uh, and went to a congressional watch job and people were, oh my God, that's a terrible, terrible stuff. Well, let's look at what actually happened here. They sent payments to 160 million households Dead taxpayers, yes, they had a million of them that they hit there. The error rate on that, however, was 0.4%. Wow, not bad, pretty good for government rate. Was it substantive? Yes, it was a $1.4 billion amount. But the IRS also had to send that money to dead people. If you died between the time you were eligible for it and the time they actually sent it to you, um, they had to still send it to your date in order to do this. So the real headline here should have been the government did its job pretty damn well. Speed was the priority. And within two weeks, the IRS delivered $80 million, uh, excuse me, 80 million payments electronically uh, in order to do this. And this was an example that economists are going to use for years and years saying adding money to the economy directly does impact people. Again, data quality error originally presented that way. Absolutely not. As far as I'm concerned, the government gets an A for that one. Here's another one. A little bit of an older example, but nevertheless problematic. We got a letter from the bank at one point and called the bank and said, hey, bank, uh, thanks for sending us this. Um, it was really nice that you did this. What can we spend this on? Tools alone would not have prevented this error. And we lost confidence in the ability of the bank to manage funds because they sent us a gift card for zero dollars. That's a structural error, not a uh, uh, practice-oriented error in here. Here's another one. I've been a member of the IEEE for more than 30 years, and I logged onto their website one day, and it said I'd been a member for three minutes, four seconds. Again, sort of silly, but nevertheless problematic. Or an example of the Port of Seattle, where it cost them a million dollars to retool while they put in a cable because the original cable dimensions had been rounded down from 2.52 inches to 2.5 inches. Again, a million dollars and years of delay in this case in order to do this. In fact, I tell these examples so much that I want organizations to say, oh my God, please, Peter, are you going to tell us the chocolate story again? And when I say again, they actually get it. They understand what's going on in this era because they've now inculcated this into their culture. Uh, here's one where Britain, the country, had 17,000 pregnant men because of coding errors, misplaced keystrokes here and there can cause this. Uh, same thing in the UK during the coronavirus, the use of Microsoft Office wrong version caused them to misunderstand the numbers they were getting because the XLF files only contain 65,000 rows as opposed to the million rows that you can now put in an XLFX file, but the data was dropped without notification. Finally, one last example here again, I bought a glass turntable for my microwave oven at one point. In fact, the microwave oven itself was only $40 and like a knucklehead, I dropped it. So I got on the website and looked for another one, put in, I'm selecting from microwaves and I'm looking at the model. I put my model in, up, oh, can't find the part. I'm looking for the part that I'm looking for. It's not called a glass oven turntable. That would be too logical in this case. But instead what I found was 
uh, a tray dash cooking. Okay, well, not the greatest. Once again, a data quality problem because a user can't find this. And here's the other real part. Notice that the tray dot cooking for the microwave that I wanted in particular was $8 more than the cost of the microwave that came with this. Now, this could have been planned obsolescence, but uh, nevertheless, still results in a very significant problem. You would not have gotten this problem to solve using just tools. And the reason for that is because data is not broadly or widely understood. Uh, again, it's like the blind people approaching the elephant, they each approach a different part and to them it looks differently. Data looks very similarly diverse in looking at this. In fact, if we look again in different cultures, we'll see love and hate. And if you travel internationally, you'll see these signs still up in the airport. Many of the data quality challenges that you come to are unique all the way around the world, which leads us to the general conclusion that data knowledge is too little and too informal. Data op management actually happens pretty well at the work group level. It is a defining characteristic of it, but watch what happens next. Without any guidance, without any formal education, without good data literacy, in your focus on trying to do data quality, you'll end up with what I call the Wally Easton problem. Wally here, of course, is playing piano. He's doing a great job of playing it, but if you ask him to do quality as his primary objective, he's probably not achieving it. The question is, what do we want our knowledge workers spending their time and energy doing? And the answer is not becoming Wally Easton uh, in order to do this and to get the data out of our well-running machinery because data quality problems become the sand in the machinery in order to do this. Many organizations think data is the new oil, but if we don't have the knowledge, skills, and the abilities in order to do this, the data engineering skills, we will not be able to address these things. And this leads to something that I call the bad data decisions spiral. Business decision makers and technology decision makers are not data knowledgeable. This means that what happens is they get bad data decisions, and those bad data decisions lead to poor treatment of organizational assets and poor quality data in the process, which leads us to poor organizational outcomes. Of course, the problem here is that if we don't correct this and intervene and break out of this cycle, we will repeat until complete. Now, it was a very poor sample of Morgan Freeman saying this is wrong, and of course it is wrong. In fact, a very simple example that many organizations have encountered in this area is installing a very good package like Salesforce and saying Salesforce should be installed by, oh, I, let's just say October 1st uh, by, to meet some arbitrary IT deadline, which means that the data quality that goes into, excuse me, the quality data that goes into the Salesforce.com system is of less than it should be. Problem is that our users can't tell the difference between Salesforce filled with poor quality data, but functioning correctly, and Salesforce sucking. So it's a, a real issue for organizations. This is the reason that you don't want to focus on just data quality, but in fact, make sure that you focus on data quality in sharing. So I spent a little bit of context here approaching data quality. Let's move now to what do we need to get better at in order to do this. And the first answer for this is systems thinking. It's not well taught, but it is the idea that we can't understand our systems if we can't see both the forest and the trees not necessarily at the same time, but certainly related. In other words, we can't fully understand the problem is unless we understand it in relation to the whole. Systems thinking leads us to some very easy things that we can do in order to understand these. Here's an example of one, a simple input process output diagram or an IPO diagram. If my inputs, my process and my outputs are labeled as such, make pizza, that's the name of the process here. And my inputs are dough and water. I hope everybody can see that this is a problem because unless you say my pizza consists solely of dough and water, which I'm pretty sure most of your pizza do not, uh, it's very improper to label the outputs of this pizza unless you have some sort of miraculous process that occurs. A better way to do this is in fact to relabel this to say make pizza crust. Now I can go back in here and say make, make crust for the pizza and get it correctly. These are ways in which your knowledge workers can assess data quality challenges in a way that makes a lot of sense.
if we look at something called a data quality steward, and not necessarily part of this particular topic, the steward responsibilities are to understand what level of quality is required by my processes. If I'm baking the crust for only five minutes and my inputs are too much water and not enough dough, I'm going to have a problem. I need to understand the process. What role does data quality play in my processes in order to be able to contribute to the whole? And what are the quality attributes that are required by each downstream customer? The pizza dough should be cooked before it is uh, the uh, ingredients are added to the top of the pizza dough. Another question that's very reasonable to ask from a data quality management perspective is how long is it going to take? And let me just give you an example that's not really related to data quality, but in some ways it is. Uh, a question that was asked at one of the groups that I worked for was why is input mortality so high in the location they were in? The answer turned out to be malnourished mothers. But of course, you have to keep asking the question why. Why were the mothers malnourished? Well, it turned out that we had in this particular locale substandard biology educations in the high schools. Why were the biology programs substandard? Well, most of the biology teachers had a relatively poor education with respect to teaching biology. Uh, again, it's not a big secret that one of the booby prizes that you get for flunking out of a PhD program is the ability to go in and teach high schoolers what you originally wanted to do research in. And so why do we have a poor biology teacher education situation because the biology profession was unaware of the consequences. So the question comes up, what units should we use to measure progress? Is this going to be uh, fixed in hours? No. Weeks? No. Months? No. Uh, quarters? Maybe, but years minimally, likely decades in order to fix this. This is the reason data quality challenges can become more complex. And of course, the real reason that you want to have technologies such as demonstrated by our product uh, sponsors here in order to do this. We're back to our three-legged stool again here. It's unlikely that you're going to encounter data quality just by itself. So here's an example where there's a CRM related piece back to our salesforce.com example here. And the data quality aspects of it certainly are important, but they should be related to the data governance aspects. In fact, I've rarely found a data quality problem that stands out by itself. Almost always, you relate it to at least multiple areas within the DIM box. So here's one, for example, relating data quality government governance and data quality management to data warehousing activities or something along those same lines. What approach should we take as we're doing this? Well, it turns out the Deming cycle. If you're not familiar with the Deming cycle, I just Google it or I'm giving you a link here in the slides here that you'll get, of course, at the end of this, which is plan, do, study, act, or plan, do, check, act. Many people refer to it in each of those ways. Uh, again, when we look at it from that perspective, the planning part says, let's look at a cost. Let's look at it from a holistic system theory perspective so that we can understand that we don't want to just fix something. We want to fix something material, something that is non-rock, something that will help our organization achieve its strategic objectives. Then, of course, we deploy this. Many times people call this a data profiling cycle. Uh, both of our, our, our sponsors here today have referred to it in different ways, uh, but it still involves in the same kind of things. And then we see if what we did worked. And if it doesn't, then we need to go back to the beginning and start over again. I have found over my 30 years in this business that in general, all quote methodologies accrue to this plan, do, check, act piece. But let's look at it from another perspective, which is that when we're developing new systems and we're putting new uh, information into a brand new system, which only happens about 20% of the time, we only spend 20% of our dollars investing in new systems development and 80 percent goes into refining it if we do it for new systems development that means we're going to follow the structure going this way which involves metadata creation structuring data creation and all the rest if we're starting at new systems i'm excuse me we're existing systems by reverse engineering we're reversing the cycle and reverse engineering many things that are occurring within our area each of these things are very important to understand in terms of what we're trying to do to get better. How do we get better at it? Well, let's keep the focus on where we need it to be by 
employing strategic thinking. And unfortunately, the word strategy was co-opted by a bunch of management consultants a long time ago, back in the 50s. And so it becomes this grand plan. But I prefer uh, the military definition. The, the consultants, the management consultants definition of strategy is a thing. The plan used by the military, which is where the term strategy originated and is still used, is that strategy is a process. Strategy is a pattern in a stream of decisions. And what that means is when we're doing quality engineering, you know, we allow the form of the problem to guide the solution, decompose the problem, look at a variety of tools for simplifying understanding and addressing the problem, give her a strategy that moves us forward and provide the criteria for evaluating the various solutions. Most importantly, developing a framework of knowledge for organizing all of this information. Now, investing in this, if I've got a million dollars to invest in this, I like to use this analogy from seven of nine in Star Trek, if any of you remember, they think this was the third version of Star Trek guy here. If you had a million dollars to invest in a data quality tool, how much do you need? Well, it turns out you need, most people will say $100,000 to put the people in process support. Uh, some people will say half a million, gosh, a million. Actually, the number is $4 million. Whatever you're spending on your technology, you need to invest four times that amount, excuse me, five times that amount in order to come up with really good results. So just buying this technology and expecting it to work is not a way to do it. And if you've only got a million dollars to invest in it, invest 200000 in the technology and 800000 in people in process support. It's also important that you change your vocabulary around this. Again, from an engineering perspective, we might say, I'm going to clean some data. But what the business wants to hear is, I'm going to decrease the number of undeliverable targeted marketing ads. Or the engineer might say, I'm going to reorganize the database. Whereas the business wants to hear, I'm going to increase the ability of the sales force to perform their own analysis. The engineer might say, I'm going to develop a technology. Whereas the business says, we want a common vocabulary. I'm going to optimize the query, says the engineer. The business says, if you save a cent, excuse me, a second off of a task that runs a billion dollars a day, that's a quantifiable savings in there. Or my own favorite, reverse engineer the legacy system. The key is we're going to understand what's good and bad about the old existing system so that we can formally preserve what needs to be preserved and where we can get rid of the bad stuff so it isn't included in the new system. Finally, in terms of looking at this, it's real important to focus your efforts in one area or another, but not both. And the two areas are improving your existing operations or doing something innovative. It gives us our standard four quadrant consulting diagram. Organizations without the formalized approach to data quality, we agree that's bad and shouldn't be doing it. <clears throat> on the other hand, if we focus our quality efforts on increasing effectiveness and efficiencies, one might think that Walmart is good at that. And I can tell you from personal experience, they are in fact quite good at that. However, if one says we're going to use our data uh, quality to improve strategic opportunities, which is a completely different area, uh, one might say that Apple is good at that. And again, I can say from personal experience, Apple does a very excellent job of doing that. But trying to do both of those simultaneously is really bad idea. Again, just imagine for a minute here that we take the folks at Walmart that have been trained and socialized and rewarded for years and years to increase their effect and efficiency and say, now be innovative, their heads are going to explode. Similarly, will the innovative people at Apple have their heads explode if we tell them to be cheap about the process? So what makes the best sense? Look at your initial savings in efficiency and effectiveness. And remember, my lifetime total here is one and a half billion dollars for organizations and use that savings that you have in those areas to go on and achieve additional strategic opportunities. Uh, with that. Many of you have not seen the term munge before. Munge is an official term that comes out of Wikipedia, and it's the idea of doing things to data that we need to do that are typically destructive in nature and appear, unfortunately, as somewhat alchemic in order to do this. And yet, everybody understands data comes to you, but it's got to be cleaned and or grouped and organized in order to do this. The question comes up then, how do we spend our time doing this? Once again, I put up this doomsday picture here because most people say, well, let's make it half and half. And now that's not a really good ratio. In fact, the answer, what we'd like it to be, is 80-20. 20, 
but it's 80-20 in the wrong direction. And everybody knows this. So if it, the case that that is, in fact, 80% of your dollars invested in this are going to only account for 20% of your data, it's going to be problematic. All organizational challenges have root data causes that are somewhere problematic. It helps if you have a burning bridge. Here's an example of Nike discovering that its brand new shoes burst within two minutes of being on the floor, causing one of their star players to go down. These burning bridges are the idea that you have management's attention, but oftentimes they say buy something and then get the quality. Uh, again, both of our, our, our sponsors here will say a fool with a tool is still a fool and that something needs to be accomplished beyond this. So the early cases have a dual purpose, make the change that will fix it in the immediate challenge and illustrate why a programmatic approach to this is much better because the math is very, very simple. If X is invested in Y, then the outcome Z must result in Z being greater than X. So at the beginning of the project where you know the least about it, everybody has to agree on these resources. And again, it gets confusing. So what? But if we can quantify that $100 invested, cleaning one set of data will result in a Z that is $1,000. Now I care. Of course, everybody wants to know when are you going to be done fixing your data quality, the answer is that data projects aren't, excuse me, data quality is not a project, that data being a durable asset has evolution that needs to be there in a long-term focus around it. The difference between a project and a program is that projects have a start and a finish and programs do not. So your data quality program, and this is important for you to make sure that your management understands, must last at least as long as your HR program is going to from this point on out. What do we mean by a program? You have an ongoing commitment, you have governance around it, you have executive leadership capabilities, and you have a data quality approaching, inheriting both budget, senior management attention, and reasonable timelines. One way to look at this is the way in which they fix bridges in New York City. We start out by painting and maintaining the bridge on one end of it, and we have a team that is set up to go around by the time they finish at the other end, they're ready to start over on this process a second time in order to do this. Again, painting is continuous and optimized along there and ensures a knowledgeable workforce that is specialized in focusing in on those areas. Because what we're trying to do is find all of our hidden data factors in our organization. That's department B having to do something that department A should have really fixed and department C having to fix something that department B should have really fixed. These hidden data factors turned from Tom Redman are all over the place. And what it means is that any data quality challenge is always filtered through some sort of IT system or business challenge, which means it's hard to recognize that all of these business challenges have the same root cause. And until we do that kind of analysis, we're not going to know about how that works. It means that we have a data component that is inevitably at the bottom of it. And it means that we need a specialized team that is deployed to create a repeatable process to develop sustainable organizational sets of skills in order to do this. I'll give you a very specific example. Walked into a logistics company that I was working with for a number of years, and they were correcting every item on the invoice because the system put out incorrect data. However, when I talked to the manager and said, you know, you could fix this in a different way instead of having 100 associates fix this, they went and said, no, 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 no. I'm having the best year I've ever had, and I'm going to double the number of people in this room. Well, of course, I could walk down the hall and speak with the chief financial officer, and she told me that if you can fix this problem in less than one month for less than $700 million, $750 million, I'd have a positive return on investment in 30 days. She understood the problem. But unfortunately, the person who was locally in charge of this did not. As an analogy, it's very important to think of the old joke in New York City, how does one get to Carnegie Hall? And the answer, of course, is practice, practice, practice. It's good to have some good music, but it's also good to have the skill sets that you need to have. So the tools that, again, are going to be important, but it's just as important to develop our people the skills in order to full uh, fulfill our areas in order to do this. Once again, we've looked at this approaching data quality. What do we need to get better at? And how do we get better at the process? It's a bit of a short, dense piece here, but it's recorded so you can go back and reread.
read it. I just want to do a couple things to sum up here. First of all, if others don't understand what it is you're doing, you're always going to be perceived as a cost basis. This is really problematic. On the other hand, if they understand what it is that you do, your ability to explain this to others, how these tools and technologies are going to be helping you out in the long run, then you are perceived with a value by it. And that's very important in order to get there. Similarly, a lot of these wonderful things that say, ah, high quality data is critical and you need to have it for, and here's some really nice buzzwords on the screen. This is not helpful because it doesn't tie anything directly into there. So here's a couple of winning cards, if you will, for your data program success. The project needs to be small and they shouldn't be able, be allowed to begin until the entire project requirements are verified. Similarly, the project owner must be skilled at data. You have that requisite experience, so let's make sure we put our best team forward as we go about doing this. The process must be ready for agile, not agile, but ready for it. it the construction techniques that everybody has adopted, which is the idea that Agile is the best way we've come up with of developing higher quality systems faster. However, it's not easy, it's easier. The team must be highly skilled in both data quality processes and learning the tools. Few teams have this requisite success in order to start out with. And finally, the organization itself must be highly skilled at emotional maturity, understanding the patient, that we aren't going to measure the output of this in hours and weeks and months, but it's going to be measured in quarters and years in order to do this. Finally, one last piece before we get to the finale of this, which is the approach only works if we know where the data needs to be fixed. If we can communicate precisely and correctly amongst team members, sponsors, and collaborators, and we are adept with the correct technology approach. Because something I have observed over the years is that data people are really good at celebrating data things happening. But we haven't gotten as good as we should be at celebrating when those data things happen, that the organizational things happen and result in things that the people in the corner offices care about. Now, in most cases, that is a dollar representation. However, in many organizations I've worked with, it's saving lives or it's achieving higher success rate in the overall wellness of the planet. So let's keep an idea on these things that we really need to be focusing in on these areas in a way that moves the needle. It's wonderful to celebrate data things that happen, but you need to make sure that when you celebrate a data thing happens, you take it the next step and say, and because this data thing happened, the organization went faster, better, cheaper, or incurred less risk around the process. With that, I'm going to leave you with a couple of pieces here. These are the value components that you can use. Again, we're not going to walk through them on the webinar here because we've only got a, about 90 seconds left to go. But you can look at these pieces and see what are the various components that things need to make. Not all of these are going to be important to everybody all the time. Here's the data representation quality pieces there. Again, notice these are 10 of these, 12 of these, there's a lot. Not all of them are going to be important for each of your projects each of the time. So it's important that as you're developing a data quality engineering approach, that you circle at most three of these on each of these. And sometimes it's even fewer than that. In this manner, you will then be able to start focusing in and applying this in a way that's going to actually move the needle from place A to place B in order to do this. If you're not able to move the needle, people are going to question the investment that you make in our sponsors' tools in order to do that. And with that, I'm gonna invite Aaron and Marcus back on here and say, after I give you a brief commercial for our upcoming webinars, this will finish our 13th year. So we'll be starting our 14th year mark uh, in order to do this. Uh, we can now jump back in here and uh, see what questions you guys have for us. Uh, in order to talk about things. So uh, with that, yeah. Aaron, Marcus, welcome back. Thank you. We, we, really enjoyed that presentation.
Yeah, wonderful job as always, Peter. Uh, we do have one question in Q&A, so people get your questions in there. Uh, we did have a little bit of a thread on chat that I think would be a, a, a good thing for us to discuss, Peter and, and Aaron and Marcus. Um, there was a little bit of a, a jibber-jabber about um, uh, critical data elements and, and, uh, and how that uh, impacts how you might approach a data quality solution. Do you want to uh, give a, a second to talk about focusing on critical data elements? Sure, and I'll, I'll start off and then then maybe we'll go uh, Aaron and then Marcus uh, for the answers on this. But the part I represented earlier there about data rot is absolutely related to this concept. When you've mm -hmm. identified critical data elements, many organizations define them slightly differently, but let's just think about a key performance indicator uh, and that you have something that somebody's going to be measured on their value. Again, we've decided that this indicator must go up or down or whatever the result is. The data supporting that is going to be of critical interest to certain people in the organization, likely, for example, the CEO, if they've been told to turn the company around or otherwise make a difference in that. So that critical data element is certainly a candidate for putting effort into. However, if you don't understand that that critical data element also spawns derivative data elements that are on top of that as well, it'd be very difficult to measure that in proportion. Aaron, I'll turn it over to you and get your comments on it. And please feel free to disagree with me because I don't think we've got broad agreement out there <laughs> in industry. Um, yeah, great. No, I, I think I would definitely um, echo what you were saying there. And um, I think also earlier in the presentation, you know, you're mentioning how even though we're coming at it from a, you know, a solution and kind of a vendor or software standpoint, that I definitely agree there's a lot of, you know, process that goes around this as well and getting the executive sponsorship and buy-in. Um, that said, from, you know, our kind of solution standpoint, we tend to focus on what are the specific metrics that we can surface and make really visible for the, the kind of end user to then go and arm them for those conversations upstream. Um, so really simple things like being able to see um, for a source, what's the, the fill rate, like how much you know key data is missing, um, like the social security number for a record or whatnot. And we've found that when organizations have that visibility, it kind of helps move away from the kind of vagueness of you know, subjective opinion of what's the quality of data, but then being able to um, both flag the issue and then kind of use that as a basis for what's the impact to the downstream business initiatives. Well, I'm, you're saying that I'm popping up the uh, master reference and all other types of data slide in here to show a similar example here, which is that if the error is in the reference data, it can control the impact of an awful lot of things that are happening in there. So you're really looking at where should you be applying leverage within that. Marcus, any thoughts on the critical data element? Again, feel free to disagree. Uh, no, I mean, I, I basically agree with, with what you said, right? Um, so um, yeah, you need the you need the tools to to measure data quality and critical data elements are, are a key piece of that too. Just because I'll, I'll I'll be a little bit of a stick in the mud here too, Peter. Um, oh, go for it, Mark. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, because my definition of critical data element is uh, any element at your organization that has a high impact on your ability to execute on your business strategy. So I kind of like to to focus in on that, and I like your KPI example for that reason. But I I really like to to kind of dig down into the into the nitty gritty sometimes, and and it kind of segues into a question that popped up into Q and A is. Um, um, IDing like identifying critical data elements is is subjectively driven by people, but uh, can tools help ID those critical data elements by sheer fact that they're used in multiple processes and metrics? Oh my goodness, yes. Uh, one of the things that, that both of our, our sponsors have is the ability to determine data usage from a number of different perspectives. Maybe each of you would like to talk about that as an illustration. Uh, again, I'm using master reference data here at the part, but uh, uh, you know, where where in the tool set should one look to determine whether some piece of data is used by multiple places around the organization? Well, Marcus, go first this time. How about that? Uh, 
you're muted, Marcus, if you're trying to talk. Yeah, I got some issues with my audio audio here. So, <laughs> so, so sorry. sorry for that. Uh, so yeah, it has been continuing the whole evening. I don't know what's going on. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so the, the question was, we're still looking at critical data elements and Mark's taking a definition that is data elements that are used in multiple places, perhaps not known. And I think mm -hmm. one of the things that you had in your presentation was the, mm -hmm. the data observability so that you could use that technology, that capability, to help organizations identify which are candidate critical data elements that could be verified and then, and then um, you know, become the focus of your first sort of instead of uh, initial data quality engineering approaches. Yeah, no, that, that's a good example, right? Yeah, so critical data elements are the ones that have the most impact on the business. Absolutely. I mean, lineage and uh, data observability tools can actually help you to identify that. So because, yeah, with data observability, we look at lineage as well and how things are connected. So uh, again, uh, even if you are not aware that this may be a critical data element, because it's not a social security number or something that you typically would associate with a critical data element, but that has a lot of impact nevertheless. Uh, yeah, that, that should also be treated as a critical data element and uh, tools like data observability tools can actually help you to identify those as well. Yeah. And Aaron, you mentioned a very quick return on investment of a 90 day uh, approach to that. Uh, again, that's the kind of, Thing that is music to many managers' ears. If I'm going to invest in something, how soon am I going to get a payback on that? I gave an example, and again, many people actually push back and challenge me on this and say, well, you know, this example that you gave with the logistics company right there at the very end, how could somebody be so stupid that they would think that fixing the data quality problem would be more effective than in fact correcting it at the source code? But this is a real life example. Uh, that, that happened in, in this instance. And again, they had a locally optimized data manager that was simply wasting company money by adding more people to a room as opposed to fixing the product, excuse me, as fixing the data where it resided in the first place. Yeah, thank you, Peter. That's a great example. And it reminded me of, um, you know, when you were mentioning about how it's important to kind of have a handle on how the project is, is scoped up front and set the expectations of the business around that. We found that that really helps with um, getting, seeing that value quickly. And um, I think to to your point, when you know you were showing on the one hand, there's the data challenges. And then on the other hand, there's the, the business impact from those challenges. That's really where we've seen, um, you know, kind of our um, data champions get the most traction is when they're able to really start with a business initiative and then work backward from there. What are the kind of data quality um, issues that need to be addressed, um, resolved, um, taken ownership of across the business in order to deliver on those initiatives. So if, if you have a, an initiative to improve customer experience by um, delivering you know, more uh, enriched profiles to your customer facing agents in a call center, for example, um, well, how are you going to be able to integrate um, several different you know, systems, CRM, point of sale, et cetera, uh, to do that? Um, so that's um, kind of one quick way of how we think about it. Excellent. Awesome. There are lots more questions about critical data elements in the Q&A, but uh, let's uh, change it up a bit here. And we have an excellent question. Um, is managing... Is measuring and managing the quality of unstructured data feasible and sustainable? So I would say short answer, yes. And again, we can do that with that plan, do, check, act cycle that I mm -hmm. talked about uh, in, in here. Um, it's not something that we are as practiced at. And so it appears to be harder. But uh, part of that... Uh, uh, um, one and a half billion dollars came out of a uh, large piece of equipment that was being managed by one organization. And when they bought this one piece of equipment, they actually purchased 3 million pieces of data with each piece of equipment, as in the, the piece of equipment had 3 million characteristics about it. 
that controlled uh, the way in which it was was uh, operating. Uh, that was not at all clear to the organization that only one of those three million individual data items actually determined whether it was an obsolete piece of equipment or not for the given use that it had. And consequently, we had to go through and parse through that Again, people call it unstructured data. Truly, if it was unstructured, we, we couldn't do it. So the proper terms for it are tabular versus non-tabular data. But nevertheless, it's still, you'll never explain that to management, right? They're going to think unstructured uh, in terms of that. And the same exact process, the Deming cycle here, worked very, very well in helping this organization look through this voluminous set of specifications that were essentially inside of a Word document in order to, to, to find um, the critical data elements that were necessary to control whether this machine was obsolete. Now I'm using it in a different angle in this case because there was a, a focus here on the mission uh, around that. But nevertheless, still, I think a good example. Again, uh, Aaron, you want to jump in first or Marcus, who, who wants to take this one as well? Structured versus unstructured data. Yeah, I mean, uh, it comes up a lot, right? A lot of customers these days are specifically asking uh, for capabilities around measuring the quality of, of unstructured data. Um, I think it's it's possible, but uh, it is definitely significantly harder than, uh, than managing uh, structured data, but uh, it becomes more of a focus for our customers as well, because um, I think everyone is used to uh, measure the quality of structured data. And uh, everyone also has a lot of unstructured data that is mostly, uh, definitely not at that level um, uh, that uh, uh, structured data is monitored and observed at this point. Thanks, Marcus. Aaron, any thoughts? Structured and unstructured. Yeah. Well, I, I guess my first thought when I, I heard the question was, you know, definitely it's it's not sustainable to try to do that without having, you know really purpose-built um, solutions and technology for doing so, you know, because you have your core business needs to deliver on. And then um, definitely on the unstructured data front and when you're dealing with big data volumes, that would become you know unmanageable to try to um, develop ways in-house to do that. Um, that said, it kind of made me think of, you know, that's a, a core problem that um, some of the MDM functionality will address is um, getting structured data, unstructured data, and consolidating that into a single source of truth. Um, so I guess just my my short answer is, um, you know, kind of that age old, you know, build versus buy decision. How do you um, look at what are ways to kind of, rather than trying to do all of that yourself, figure out are there tools out there that um, are already able to do some of those things that um, need to be done, not just now, but on an ongoing basis for your data quality program. And a mature data quality program will have a variety of tools available to it, including the smarts that are in the people's heads. This is one of the reasons I urge groups to, folk, to, to create a dedicated group to this, if your organization can afford it, because these people will be thinking about the process day and night Whereas somebody who's trying to do this and dedicate 10% of their time to doing data quality uh, will have other things competing with their mind share space uh, in order to do this and will not have a chance to get good with the tool sets. Yeah. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. that. Um, I, what I find interesting about this, and maybe we can get everybody's opinion on this too, is I think um, the demand now to better manage unstructured data and and to apply some quality controls on unstructured data is because it's largely becoming inputs into gen ai so as our friend pam said in chat uh good inputs good outputs uh the new gigo and the ai world um what do you guys think about about that about uh, the impact on on ai marcus you guys want to go first uh sure yeah. i'll go ahead uh no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, that's 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 definitely that definitely has an impact. Yeah. So Gen AI uh, changes uh, a lot of things, and uh, again, going going back to the fact that uh, in many cases the structured data is in 
reasonably good shape um, if you apply it data quality practices um, over time and are not just uh, starting to do so. But the the unstructured data is is causing a problem, and uh, yeah, it is things that Gen AI will ingest. And um, yeah, if uh, you have bad quality there, of course, your results uh, will also be bad. Um, yeah, and I think for me, uh, you know, Peter hit on the idea of garbage in, garbage out, and how you know, if you put AI in the middle of that, it applies just as well as but um, a lot of other things in the middle. So I do think, you know, it's it, more of the focus is on um, getting really the structured data ready for the downstream Gen AI initiatives um, as kind of a, you know, a phase one. And that's where um, you know, we kind of put more of our focus is, hey, if you're um, doing a downstream analytics initiative um, or if you're, you know, trying to do something like train a, a chatbot that's going to be um, helping agents in a call center to you know respond in real time or just will be like kind of autonomously responding. You want to know that it's using um, kind of the best source of truth for the customers that it's going to be interacting with, that it has full visibility, um, to like the transactions those customers have gone through, et cetera. Um, so I think, you know, I would kind of split between like, yes, Gen AI itself, there's, uh, it's very good at um, kind of unstructured data, the large language models that are supporting it or that are being created by um, enterprises and new business initiatives. But on the other hand, you can still have um, you know, structured data that is kind of the basis for um, training and fueling those um, downstream Gen AI initiatives. So kind of thinking of Gen AI like any other business initiative that needs trusted data to flow to it and that structured data can be a big part of that, you know, coming from CRM, ERP, et cetera. Excellent thoughts on, on both of those. I'll add a little bit to it with this sort of two data points since we're all data people here as well. And that is that uh, generative AI is currently rated at about a 15% error rate. Uh, that's a B student if you go into a you know a graded type situation in 85 degree, which is good enough for many applications. And of course, that's the general case uh, on this. But there's a woman named Nina Schick who has written a wonderful book uh, out there that she says that uh, unfortunately, much of that structured data that both of you are referring to is being used to create more website based data. Now, if you compound the 15% on a continuous basis, you end up with a situation where she calculates that by the end of 2029, uh, so much error will be out there that nobody will trust anything on the internet. Remember, we used to have a joke that we would say, ah, it came from the internet, it must be right. And now it, it'll be, uh-oh, it came from the internet, it can't be correct. Now, that's an interesting data point. There's another interesting data point, too, which is that both uh, I'm uh, the Economist and the Wall Street Journal, so I should say all three of those, uh, uh, have noted an alarming decrease in the amount of data that's available to generative AI programs. So you might say to yourself, how can we possibly be experiencing a decrease in AI that's available to these things? Well, there's a uh, Project Nightshade, if you look it up, it tells you how to poison your data so that it's not ingestible by these AIs, which is in some ways kind of nice. Uh, I'm not suggesting that you know poisoning the data out there is a good thing in general, but that the amount of data that is available to generative AI has actually peaked and seems to be shrinking at a relatively alarming rate, uh, which is, again is not a development that we had expected to occur. So given both of those two developments, I think we're into some interesting times in terms of how that uh, gets in. Mark, did you know you're gonna open up that can of worms with that question? That's sort of, yeah. <laughs> it is an interesting conversation. I, I do like thinking about it in my spare time too. So um, we do have somebody who asked my favorite question in Q&A. So I have to ask it. Uh, does IT decide on solutioning for data quality 
uh, or is the uh, data governance and, and data governance stakeholders involved? Well, I can give the answer of what should be the case. Uh, <laughs> and that is about one in 10 AI group, excuse me, uh, IT groups are really good at this. Uh, and, and look at you know some of the conversations that we're about to have, because Mark knows where this is leading in here. Uh, and, and saying, why on earth? We were already doing data governance. We understand what data quality is, and we're doing really good work. I, I'll give you a very specific example. Uh, one of the first examples we did of really world-class data governance projects came from the World Bank, uh, where they were doing some work in their area, and they just said, "What? how else would we do this? You know, this is the right way to do it. But of course, that lesson hasn't been universally learned. And so consequently, there are unfortunately more people out there that don't know how to do it out of IT, that IT simply says, if they can connect to the servers, our job is done. Uh, whereas the business, of course, is expecting somebody that's wearing the title chief information officer in their organization to be paying at least some attention to data quality type of initiatives. But that's from the academic perspective. Let me ask our two uh, sponsors here, where are you seeing much of your business inquiries coming from IT uh, or, or governance uh, type approaches? Because I think our, our group would be very interested in learning that. Yeah, I would say um, at Reltio that the interest comes from IT, but the, the models vary. Um, it's not always a centralized governance model. A lot of times organizations are moving to more federated governance where you know, at the end of the day, it's about what what's the quality of the data in those source systems. You know, if you think of that dashboard I was showing and where it's showing, hey, you know, half of the customer profiles are missing their email. How do we resolve that? Um, at the end of the day, it comes to like, well, it needs to be resolved and um, someone owns the source system that's feeding into that. So either um, the governance is, is kind of pushed down to that uh, owner of the actual data source, so more the federated model or it's centralized. And we do see more organizations going to the federated model just because it's um, more efficient for that team to um, be able to just resolve the issues at the source without you know, needing to wait for those issues to be seen um, at the centralized IT level. Um, just to do that, you know, that's kind of where it's important to have um, a really business user-friendly tool that um, gives those uh, whoever you know, in that department is going to be responsible for the quality of the data, gives them that visibility so they can kind of self-service, identify those issues and resolve them without needing to go and make a you know, custom request to the central IT team. Thanks, Aaron. Marcus, what's uh, Informatica's perspective on that? Yeah, no, no, completely agree. And this definitely also uh, has changed over the last uh, couple of years. And yeah, Aaron brought up the importance of having uh, user-friendly tools that are built for business users. And uh, yeah, couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, without without the right tools and business user friendly tools, um, it basically comes down to IT IT fixing the problems. But um, there is definitely a, a shift in uh, how enterprises and companies uh, address those those topics. That's definitely more uh, in the direction of for the business to take ownership and uh, uh, push down to IT. Thanks. So, Mark, is that a cautiously optimistic answer to your? I, yeah, I, and 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 I love seeing chat just explode with this uh, with this conversation too. Now <laughs> people are going back and forth on it, and uh, I I always like to uh, complain about IT. It <laughs> feels like it's my go to position. The one thing I will say uh, about IT, while well, they're needed to uh, implement any kind of purchase solution, obviously, uh, and integrate and and do all the security bits and pieces. Uh, of, getting tools access to the data. Um, IT doesn't really have skin in the game. They're not really a stakeholder of anything, nor do they have that core understanding of, of data. So of, of what the data means to the business or a process, you still need those subject matter experts or data stewards in the background. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and get off my soapbox here so we can do one more question. I think we've got time for one more. Yeah, and, back to our, uh, our three-legged stool that you were talking about. And uh, this is, <laughs> I don't know whether Marcus and Aaron are able to see the chat. I can't see the chat because I'm 
uh, doing this. So we have to wait till you guys send out the transcript later on to do it. But we appreciate <laughs> all the comments that are in there. It's, it's really great. Uh, we do have one uh, one more uh, a favorite question uh, of mine that, uh, again, I just have to ask it whenever it comes in. Uh, there are certain regulations now that require businesses to have a data governance program. How do you do data governance without data quality? Well, of course, the short answer is that you shouldn't. But uh, on the other hand, there are... Uh, a couple of wonderful speakers that are out there on the circuit now that are saying that, you know, we really have been approaching data quality from a much too theoretical perspective and, and we should approach it. Uh, I think Laura Madsen and uh, some others who I've seen at conferences recently, um, uh, Nicole, uh, Nicole's last name, Mark, uh, done some very good work in, in those areas of, about saying, let's, let's hold people's mm -hmm. feet to the fire. And if there is a governance issue, if it's not focused on, some aspect of qualities, uh, you know, what, what really are we doing with governance? And sometimes the answer is your data is in great shape, but that doesn't seem in my case to be the always the case that data is yeah. in really excellent condition. That's Laura Madsen and Nicole Janeway Bills, I believe. Um, there you go. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I don't consider myself an expert on data governance, but um, how... I would kind of boil it down is um, the core of data governance is about you have a set of policies um, that are created and that then need to be enforced. And um, you know, different technology, whether it's and there's a whole kind of slew of some you know solution or data quality solutions, data governance solutions. Um, Whatever the the solution is at the end of the day, that's a tool to help you enforce those policies better. Um, so I would say, you know, you can have data governance policies without having a data quality solution, but it's how effective will you be at being able to enforce those um, policies across, you know, millions of customer records that are updating in real time as your business is constantly ingesting new data sources, going through mergers and acquisitions, et cetera. Um, so it's really about how do you prevent things like um, the average, uh, um, the average enterprise now, I think Gartner had said, loses $15 million a year due to data quality issues. Um, it's not because they don't have the policies, but I would say it's more of the enforcement issue. Super. Marcus, get the last word on this one. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, a uh, short answer, yes, you can, but you shouldn't, right? Uh, I mean, you can do a lot of things. That doesn't necessarily mean you should do them. Um, I'm also not a data governance expert, but uh, yeah, uh, I mean, certainly you can you can have a bit data governance uh, program without data quality. I mean, it, it's possible, but definitely not what we uh, at Informatica would suggest our customers. So for us, uh, data quality and data governance is, is tightly integrated um, and you, you definitely shouldn't do data quality without a robust uh, data quality uh, program as well. My, my question is always, how is it that you would figure out what are the important things to focus on without the governance around? And so uh, uh, just a quick reminder, brand new book out on uh, looking at these topics and we've got some uh, upcoming webinars that hopefully be of interest to you all. And uh, Mark, turn it back over to you for the last word. Yeah. Um, thank you, everybody, uh, for the wonderful chat and interaction. Thank you so much to our sponsors, Informatica and Reltio. Um, and uh, that's all we have time for for today. Uh, so again, we'll be posting a link to the recording and the slides within a couple of business days. And thanks again, everybody, uh, for being amazing. Everybody was super fun in chat. So thank you for that. And uh, great questions and great presentations by all three of our speakers. So have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. Aaron, thank Marcus, you, thanks for joining us today. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Have a nice day, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.